Last night, my boyfriend and I were downstairs. It's a raised ranch style home. And we were just watching a movie and he went up to the window to crack it for some fresh air. We live in the Northeast and a couple of days ago, we got a good amount of snow. Now we do live in an area where wildlife is fairly common. He stood at the window and just stopped what he was doing in a complete stare. I asked, and babe, what's going on? He said, you have to come here and look at this. I got up off the couch and made my way to the window. We saw footprints and nothing like I have ever seen before. I've grown up in the woods my entire life. The men in my family are big into hunting. They're pretty big outdoorsmen. I can pretty much look at any track and know what it is. The back tracks looked like deer or rabbit, and the front ones looked like some type of bird, like a turkey, for example. The space in between them was fairly large. Whatever it was had a pretty big stride. Whatever it was looked like it had been circling the window, then to the side of the house, which our bedroom window is right above that. Also, where a cherry tree is, there's a second set of prints that looked like something started walking from the tree and just stopped. My first thought was, okay, something was just sniffing around and turned around. Well, there are no tracks back. They just completely stop. I've looked up every single possible animal that it could be, and absolutely nothing I've been able to find matches. This morning, my boyfriend went out there and looked around. My dog was with him. And as he was sniffing around, his fur was up, on high alert. He's not unfamiliar with wildlife, and this is probably the third time in his whole life that I've ever seen his fur go up like that. He said that the tracks didn't make any sense at all, that they appeared and just disappeared, and that there was no distinct pattern to them whatsoever. I know what you might be thinking. Did the snow cover them up? Maybe the wind covered the rest. We haven't had any more snow, and the snow that we do have is fairly hard. I can see my dog's tracks perfectly. Two nights ago, when these footprints could have been left, I was watching a movie down there scrolling through Reddit. I had this really weird feeling that came over me, like I was being watched. I literally pulled the blinds shut. A couple of hours later, I could hear this bush start moving outside. I figured it was just the wind or an animal. There's this big fat blue jay who does have a nest in there. But then I started to hear this faint clicking noise. This is the second time that I've heard that noise. The last time was when I lived two hours away, again in the middle of nowhere, and I was walking my dog at night. It made me physically ill. I figured I was just being paranoid. I was reading creepy stuff on Reddit, so I calmed myself down, telling myself that it was all in my head. We have cameras, but nothing on that side of the house, and there was nothing on any of my cameras. If anybody knows what these footprints might be, if it is in fact an animal, that would be great. I'm actually kind of scared. For the last three days, I've been having really bad anxiety. I just can't pinpoint it. I just feel like something is wrong or something bad is going to happen. My internal radar is going off in every possible way, kind of like a gut feeling. But like I said, I just can't put my finger on it. Something just feels incredibly off. I go hunting in Southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is my second home and I have spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. Caught all the fish in the area, hunted every legal game and spotted the rest. 
So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, just remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in, in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or lack thereof. Two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so there were at least two hours left until sunlight. I pulled my stuff out of the truck and walked into the woods. I have my shotgun and a revolver and knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second growth forest and down a rather steep hill, across some bottoms, then a lung burning steep climb to get to another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I do it often. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck, and get to climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed there was more noise than usual. Something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about a quarter of the way up the hill, listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop my butt down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping that if I stay really still, that whatever I'm hearing will just lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and lay it over my knees to wait. Except I don't hear anything now. Whatever it was must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning all around as I sat. I still stayed a bit sipping some coffee to make sure, but after about 15 minutes or so of dead silence, I gave up. I probably didn't make it even four steps before the second moving thing starts up again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way I am and flip the light off again and sidestep behind a tree. Sure enough, I don't hear anything. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated before I start moving again, and my new friend does too. This is when I started to get freaked out because I worked my way up the hill, stopping to turn and look every so often. When I stopped, the sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps. Like something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times. And by now I'm sweating bullets and freezing cold because I'm sweating bullets in the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time. The last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and, in theory, keep it from moving. And I didn't hear anything again after that. I got up into my stand and smoked like five cigarettes in a row. It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind camouflage. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and went back early. And I wasn't moving slow heading back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright. I haven't told my family about this because they wouldn't believe me, but damn, it was freaky. The sound and when it decided to happen felt very human, which it likely was as poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then, when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I'm going and for how long.
The woods behind my house have always been odd. About a year ago, I had an encounter with something. To this day, I don't know what. But I know it's back, and I know it wants me. Things were quiet. We started to all forget about the mystery woodland encounter from last year. For the most part, my girlfriend and I had moved on from it. That was until two months ago, on a cold February morning. My girlfriend discovered that one of our chicken's legs had been snapped in half. I took her to the vet and they were as confused as I was. There was no sign of any attack or any clear indication of who or what had done this. They recommended that I put her down, but I just couldn't do it. I believed that maybe with some rehab and a safe environment, she would heal. I took her home and I put her in the pool house. I went about my days thinking nothing of it. To this day, she hops around on one foot, but she's thriving. Anyway, a week goes by and I come out one morning to find another chicken that had both legs snapped clean in half. I ran over as fast as I could to find a similar situation. There was no sign of attack or any blood to be found. I took her to the vet and unfortunately, I had to put her down. At this point, I had a chilling feeling as to what might be going on here. I think it's back. The next day, I set up cameras facing those woods. I spent $700 on the best trail cams and the most well-reviewed SD cards I could find, and I was determined to capture it this time. I made a rule that I would check them every day, twice a day, so as not to miss anything. Every time, I would find nothing. Just some cats and my chickens doing animal stuff. Since we found that first chicken, I haven't been able to sleep. I've had night terrors, nightmares, and sleep paralysis almost every night. I kept having a dream about the woods. Something chasing me. Something attacking me. Or getting lost in there. I'm constantly on edge and it seems like every noise makes me jump. Yesterday morning, I went to check the cameras. They're gone. They're just gone. I was baffled and in utter disbelief. I hid these cameras so well that not even my girlfriend could find them. And yet, they're gone. I searched everywhere for these things. Every inch of my yard, every nook and cranny of the house and pool house. There is no trace of them. Angry, confused, and upset, I put on my boots, a thick jacket, and I headed into the woods. I was determined to figure out what this thing was and what it wanted with me. Remember now, those woods are dense and thick. Everything is overgrown and muddy, or so I thought. I push my way through vines and bushes, around trees and stumps, and I stumbled upon something I wish I had never found, a clearing. I stopped for a moment to try to understand what I was looking at. I wish I could share some kind of satellite view to prove that this clearing can't possibly exist. But then it dawned on me, where the hell am I? How long have I been walking? Did I go the wrong way? Am I lost? Amongst all my confusion, something catches my eye. It's one of my trail cams smashed on the ground. How the hell did this end up here? It was at this time that I realized how absolutely silent it was. I mean, I could hear my own heart beating. Reality set in and I had the immediate urge to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. This is where I'm at a complete loss. I took what I thought was maybe a hundred steps through some dense vines and brush, and there I was, at the back of my property. It felt like it took a minute or two of scrambling to get through the thick overgrowth, and I was back. Still absolutely panicking, I continued onward until I got to the back door. I bolted the door and locked myself in the bedroom. I haven't said a word to anyone today. I called out of work, and it's been about 18 hours. 
and all I can think about is going back in. I'm scared, I can't sleep, and somehow I know that it's watching me through my bedroom window. In southeast Michigan, there's a mountain bike trail called the DTE Foundation Trail, just north of Chelsea, Michigan. For a mountain biker, it has three major sections, more still under development, including connectors to a larger network, but I digress. Green Loop is easy flow. Came is big climbs, big downhills with jumps, super flow technical climbs, intermediate. Wind Loop, long flow with grinding climbs and long downhills, technical features, intermediate. Sugar Loop is fast flow and major speed, but more technical, difficult. The usual flow is you start on the green loop and move on to the big came, then the wind, then the sugar, then back up the loops to the trailhead. There's a Michigan-based blogger named Kai Juno that summed up the creepy part of this forest. This is what Kaijuno wrote. Quote, I know I've made a post about it before, but I can't find it. But the most like bone chilling thing you can ever experience is the silence when you're walking in the woods. Like it's the woods. There's always birds and bugs and frogs and stuff, but sometimes it will just go completely dead silent. Sometimes it feels like even the breeze stops, like the animals can sense a predator nearby that's even bigger and scarier than you. So what does this mountain bike trail system have to do with the silence? The west side of the wind loop. Things just happen there. I've been to DTE so many times and the uneasy feeling never goes away on the west side of the wind. I'll pass riders who have taken some bad falls and require a medevac. There's a spot where the forest looks pretty open, but it's quiet. Unless there's a storm moving through the area, you don't hear a thing. This section is about 500 to 600 feet directly south of the intersection of Gilnan Drive and Sugarloaf Lake Road. There used to be a trail that branched off to the left, and after a tree fell over, nobody ever opened it back up. There's always this heavy musk in that area specifically. I know the smell of deer and it isn't that. Something else lives in that area and it creeps me out. Part of me thinks it's a mountain lion, but those sightings are super rare and have been mostly a little bit more west or in the upper peninsula. The most perplexing thing is that this is really close to Sugarloaf Lake and there are some people living out there, so there shouldn't be a reason for this unease. I'm not the only person that's felt it, but yeah, there's something really not right with the forest there. Not too long ago, my brother was telling my mom about something that my dad had said to him quite a few years ago that always puzzled him. My dad passed away over 10 years ago, so I can't ask him about it and it really bugs me that I can't get more information. My dad loved being in the woods. They were like a second home to him. Whenever we would take a family trip into the woods, I could ask him what any animal sound was that I heard from the area and he could tell me exactly what animal was making it and any other details I asked. He grew up on a farm, spent time as a forest ranger working in the fire towers, and he enjoyed hunting, so he knew nature pretty well. The woods that we would take family trips to, he was also very familiar with, as some of the fire towers that he worked in were still standing in the area. I think nowadays only one does. 
My brother said that there was a weekend that my dad decided to take a trip to the woods by himself to do some small game hunting. Not unusual at all for him. The strange part was that my dad came home early. From where we lived at the time, it took two and a half hours and sometimes longer depending on traffic to get to the woods that he liked. He didn't spend the night, even though he had brought everything he needed to camp for two nights. Both my mom and my brother remember him coming home early. Only my dad never mentioned why to my mom and only let it slip to my brother once. My dad told my brother that he heard something making a sound in the woods, a sound that he had never heard before in all his life. He knew it wasn't from any of the animals in those woods. The sound made him pack up and head home during the night. My brother tried to press him for more details, but he quickly changed the subject and never wanted to discuss it again. He never described what type of sound it was. He just said that it wasn't from any of the animals that inhabited those woods. None of the natural ones, anyway. My dad was never easily spooked, especially by nature. Whatever he heard, we have no idea. But it sure got to him good. It eats at me that I can't ask him about it. I really want more details. My brothers still take trips to those woods, and they've never heard anything out of the ordinary while out there. So, maybe we'll never know. My uncle has a large stretch of wooded property in Missouri, about an hour and a half drive from St. Louis. He has a cabin, a small man-made lake, and trails throughout the woods. When we visited, we would spend a lot of time driving ATVs down the trails. One of the trails leads to an abandoned mining area. The area has a toppled over mine shaft, a couple of cement buildings, a sheet metal storage shed for core samples, and a sheet metal building with showers and a couple of rooms. There's a metal fence separating two sections of it that, for a while, was still mostly intact. All of it is in disrepair and hasn't been used for mining for many decades, perhaps a century. All of this lies in a large open area that has no trees, just sand and mud flats, which made it the perfect place to drive four-wheelers. We'd visit a few times each year, and we would take the four-wheelers out to the flats and have a great time riding. We never felt unsafe, and sometimes we would even go out at night to stargaze. Eventually, we started to notice that these sights pop up at the edge of the woods around the flats, like sticks stuck in the ground in lines or circular patterns with small burn piles there were usually shotgun shells, bullet casings, and beer cans spread around. Sometimes we would see spray-painted symbols on pieces of trash or trees. Basically, it looked like people shooting targets and drinking out on the flats with a touch of weirdness with the symbols. So we didn't think much of it and just decided that we wouldn't go out at night. And we started carrying guns with us when we went out, just in case. What finally did it for me, and kept me from going out there, was when we discovered that the fence had been nearly completely destroyed. Only the posts were left, and on every post someone had stuck a can or a jar of something on top. And all throughout the flats and on the trails that ran its perimeter, we would find cans and containers stuck onto the ends of tree branches. Again, it wasn't anything too weird. Like, we know people go out and break stuff and do other dumb things. What got us was the scope of it. The fence was probably a half mile in length, and every single section of metal mesh had been removed, which would have required considerable time and energy, even with bolt cutters. And that alone wouldn't be too weird, because people loot metal for scrap all the time. The thing is, none of it was gone. It was just laid on the ground next to the fence. And then somebody had taken the time to cap the posts with cans and other containers. 
Then to boot, they had taken the time to place items on the ends of tree branches every 50 feet or so, all along maybe two miles of the trails and on the perimeter of the sand flats. That was the last time I went out there. It's been 10 years and I've moved states and I have limited contact with that part of my family, so I don't really know if anything else has happened. I know it's probably nothing paranormal, just some weird human activity out in the backwoods of Missouri, but it was still pretty creepy. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves were of his slaves. Now in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically a cleared out area where there are no trees just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is a tree house that you sit in and wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on a green field, number one, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normally enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he is going to go out for a short walk to see if maybe he sees any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was still pretty light out. So I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things start to get strange. I sat there for a freaking eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he still wasn't back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or that he had gotten lost. However, he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight or dusk hour of the day, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening and waiting for a deer to walk out onto the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I really wanted my dad back. A short time passed and it's now pitch black and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was quickly turning into a panic. 
But I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch black woods where I had just seen a freaking ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted as if he hadn't been gone long at all. I asked him where the hell he'd been, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around, and came back. That timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was very unlike him to leave me alone for that long. He was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. I don't know who the ghost was that I saw. I don't know if my dad went through some kind of time warp where time sped up. I don't really know. What I do know is that I never went hunting there again, and I don't plan on ever going back. I was hunting for black bear one day, back in the early 2000s. The area I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the country is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard to access trails. We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains. I would often dive down into the hollows while he scoured the ridgelines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to keep a general idea where we were, although often the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This day was a typical Pennsylvania bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season, third and last day of the brief season it was back then. The woods were quiet with no distant whooping and yodeling of various opening day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, gray, and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day. I spent the day still hunting down this long hollow, south of a little town in north central Clinton County, with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of a ridge at the agreed upon time of 4 p.m giving us plenty of time to hike together the few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to meander its way back up to the ridge line toward where I knew he would be waiting. After close to an hour, maybe 3.30, I made my way two-thirds of the way to the top. Stopping often, I scoured the slope for that jet-black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a long-ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build, and appeared to be used only once. The ring's rocks were covered in lichen, and only had the faintest of traces of black from a long-ago fire. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope, but it was a very small, somewhat leveled edge. There I figured I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food and sit still, hoping to catch a final chance to see a bear. All the while, it felt odd, somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there. Almost felt like I was a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot. I sat for maybe 20 minutes, and then thought that it was time to continue the trek upward toward my buddy. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. As I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, rather all around in my head. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was slapped off of my shoulder. I felt the force, heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock, and I crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing onto the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in the nick of time, and quickly turned around with a mouthful of profanities for whoever I thought was going to be my brother-in-law, joking with me. There was nobody there at all. There was absolutely no way that anyone had rushed off without me either seeing or hearing them. I 
felt a sick feeling in my churning stomach. Chills went all over my body. I muttered a few Hail Marys and sped up to the top of the ridge, met my bud, and quickly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of the evening. This event has bothered me for years, and I've never been back in those particular woods since. Someday, I hope to. Maybe. I have always enjoyed the paranormal for entertainment, but kept with me a healthy dose of skepticism when it came to real life stories. Growing up, my mother was very much into the supernatural or anything paranormal. Psychics, ghosts, the afterlife, you name it. This instilled in me from a very young age a skeptical outlook on things of this nature. Instead, I would learn how psychic and paranormal experts fake evidence or cold read and things of this nature to basically debunk my mom, although I was always entertained by her stories on some level. She would always tell me stories about my supposed gift to communicate with ghosts from a very young age, and how my family members refused to babysit me because I creeped them out too much. I also have a lot of memories of being young and strange, unexplainable and downright creepy things happening to me all the time. But I would cope with it by justifying how there must be some logical explanation, such as sleepwalking or just my overactive child's mind or something. There is one experience, though, that always stuck with me that I witnessed as an adult. I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but there is something about this I cannot let go of or rationalize away. I even get a little bit emotional and start to tear up a little when I think about it today, which is unlike me. I am now 28 years old, but when I was 21, I worked in a four-star hotel and spa named Earth Castle in Scotland, located just outside of Stirling, where many of the bloody and violent wars Scotland is historically known for took place. This is a real place, and already has a reputation for being haunted. I want to tell you my experiences of working in this hotel, and the strange events I experienced while working there. To give context, the hotel is made up of two main buildings. The first is a new building, a typical hotel where the guests stay with luxury dining and spa, etc. The other building is the castle itself, which is mainly only used for weddings, and one time Sean Penn stayed with us while filming a movie. That was pretty cool. I worked as a kitchen porter. My job was to wash dishes, clean up, basically all the kitchen duties which didn't involve cooking, to allow the chef to focus on preparing the food. Whenever there was a wedding that needed to be catered for, some of us would be sent up to the castle to work there. Eventually, I refused to work in the castle. Of course, the staff there knew about the castle's reputation and would tell each other stories about what they had heard. In my skeptical mind, I simply rationalized it as local entertainment and just got on with my work. One of the most frequent occurrences that would be reported is that whenever guests would stay in the castle, they would phone the front desk in the main building and tell us that they could hear children playing and running around and ask if we could send somebody up to deal with the children. There never were any children in the building. The castle was always reserved for the bride and groom to have the place to themselves. I cannot stress how common this complaint was. Almost everyone who stayed in the castle reported the same story of being disturbed by the sounds of children playing in the hallways. Sometimes, late at night, I could hear the running coming from the upstairs balcony in the central room of the castle. If I was ever brave enough to go investigate, it would stop. The basement floor of the castle has been turned into a few guest rooms and a storage space for the staff to use. It looks like any other floor of a hotel, not the creepy basement of a castle that you might expect. There are reports that this floor is haunted by a groundskeeper, 
and I also have a few stories about people telling me about a phantom dog they could hear barking. I never encountered either of these spirits, but the reason that I'm mentioning it is that the basement floor of this castle especially terrified me. Every time I was there, I felt the most uncomfortable feeling, like when people tell you that they feel like someone's watching them. That entire floor gave me the most uneasy feeling, as if I could feel someone breathing down my neck or I was surrounded by something. I was never able to go down there without feeling stiff and having the most horrible feeling of dread come over me. It's hard to put into words. I hated going down there. If you stand outside the castle facing it, there's a dining room just to the left of the entrance on the ground floor. In this room, there's an enormous painting of a woman. I forget who she is, a wife of the commander or something who lived there. This painting was also especially creepy. She has such a stern look on her face, which I guess was common for that era and style. Very regal looking. There were a lot of unexplained noises that came from the area this painting is located in, like knocking, banging, things like that. One time, a group of us were standing in that room commenting on how depressing the painting looked, only to be interrupted by a slow scratching noise that went all the way from the top to the bottom of the 10 foot high wall that the painting was hanging on. Old castles like this do not have hollow walls. Not like a loose piece of stone could have been falling inside, which was my first thought. We could never figure out where this noise came from. The most frightening moment inside that castle happened one night during a wedding. The chefs had finished with their jobs and had taken everything back down to the main building. I was left in the kitchen to finish washing up and cleaning. The guests had left and the bride and groom were... Well, it's not my business what they were up to, but they were off in their suite. The only other people in the castle were a few remaining waitstaff also finishing tidying up. I went out the side door to the castle to have a cigarette. The southwest corner of the kitchen was the entrance to the kitchen. The southeast corner was the washing up area where I was working. And the northeast corner was a passageway to a small room where we kept plates, cutlery, and a walk-in fridge. When I came back into the kitchen after finishing my cigarette, I could hear someone working in the back room, moving cutlery around and stacking plates. The normal sounds of someone else working, so I paid no attention to it and got back to washing dishes. After a few minutes, I heard the working sounds from the other room stop and the room fell silent for a while. It sounded like nobody was moving, which I thought was strange. Another piece of information that you need to know is that another one of the girls I worked with and I would play this game where we would try to creep up on each other and scare the other person. When the sounds of the working stopped, there was an unusual silence. So I figured, aha, this is that girl and she's about to try to scare me. My plan was to continue working like normal, and then when she jumped out to try to scare me, I would be just as cool as a cucumber and be like, nice try. I waited for a full minute, and she never jumped out. I waited for a second minute, still nothing. Thinking she was just really committed to this joke, I went to investigate. I walked into this room, and nobody was there. I cannot describe how hard my heart jumped when I walked into the room to find it empty. I started questioning my own sanity and kind of freaking out. I definitely heard someone working back there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before it stopped. The workstations the chefs used formed kind of an alley you had to walk through to get out of the kitchen. Nobody could have left that kitchen without walking directly by me washing dishes. And since I was on high alert, I definitely would have noticed somebody leaving. The incident really freaked me out. I had to leave the building for a while and I really didn't want to go back in to finish my shift. Another time I was working in the same kitchen and the night security guy came through looking confused and told me to follow him. This security guy also had more than his fair share of creepy stories while walking around this building at night. But back to that in a minute. 
He took me through to a room at the back, which had a small bar and was used to entertain the wedding guests sometimes. This room was not in use that night. He asked me to tell him if I could smell anything. Upon stepping into the room, I immediately was hit with an overwhelming smell of cigar smoke. He insisted that nobody had been using this room and the guests had left a while ago. Apparently, this room was previously used as the aforementioned commander's study, where he would draw up battle plans and spend time alone. Since I was normally working quite late, I knew this night security guy pretty well. We talked about all the creepy stuff that we had both encountered in the castle, and he was insistent that it was not just stories. He began telling me of all his stories and just how commonly they occurred. After all, he was the guy who had to go check the castle out every time a guest complained about the children running around. He told me that his encounters were so frequent and impossible to ignore that he had begun to do deep research into the history of the castle and its previous inhabitants. Apparently, there were two children who had died in a fire there once, the children of the woman in the painting in the dining room. Their nanny had run back into the building to try to save them and was also killed in the fire. The night security guy told me that he had personally taken a photograph of the castle and in one of the upstairs rooms, slightly left of the entrance, you could clearly see a nanny with two children standing in front of her, looking out the window at him. Although shaken from other strange experiences, my rational, skeptical mind was still there. He was a tall, slim man in his 40s, spent a lot of time alone, walking around a castle, investigating disturbances constantly. I figured he might have been exaggerating or making it up just for a good ghost story. But the next day, he brought in the photo and showed me. In the upstairs window, just like he said, were two children and their nanny looking directly out the window, clear as day. I don't know if that man still works there or not, but he owns a picture that will give you the creeps. He doesn't seem to have put it online anywhere. I looked. If anyone from Earth Castle reads this, and a man matching that description still works there as a night security guard, tell him I'm looking for that picture. Once he showed me this photo, that was the last time I was ever in that castle. Every time a wedding was happening, I would refuse to go cater for it. I'm not going, send someone else, I would say. Eventually, I was fired from that job because the manager and I would frequently fall out over this. But honestly, I don't care. I never wanted to go near that place again. Despite keeping my skepticism, I admit there was something about that place that just wasn't right. I will remember that job and that castle until the day I die. Just thinking about being back in that building gives me the creeps. Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. 
People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the king never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea, which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms, only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel. In the summer of 2019, I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle, pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like, no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshipping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle, and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day, 
The sun made the occasional appearance, but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves, which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children, and we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire, with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows? Maybe I'll have more stories then. I was a guest at Abbey Glen Castle in Ireland on October 28th through 30th of 2019. It was a stay for my birthday. We arrived and were overwhelmed with the kindness and hospitality we experienced. We arrived late, so we dropped our bags in our room and headed for dinner in the restaurant with the piano. Our table was adorned with the Ireland and American flags a special touch for us as your international guest, I suppose. We enjoyed our dinner, and just after dessert, we were treated to a piano serenade. As we prepared to leave, if memory serves me correctly, the piano player, dressed in a nice suit, offered to take our picture. As we left the restaurant, we were handed a great picture documenting our trip. We retired to our room, ready to sleep after a long day of travel from Derry up north. That night, we struggled to be made comfortable. Both my partner and I felt a strange presence in the room. Neither of us mentioned it to the other upon awakening. But shortly after breakfast, while shopping, we compared our strange feelings. We were both shocked that the other had felt this presence. Though we had booked the stay for two nights, we politely returned our keys to the front desk and decided to forego our second night and leave to Limerick. Fast forward three years since returning. My partner has displayed the picture in our room. We have looked, passed, and gazed at the picture no less than a hundred times, always with fond memories of Ireland. But a few weeks ago, with a normal glance, she saw an image in the picture that clearly looks like a ghost or apparition as the third party to our dinner picture. We were both kind of freaked out by this sighting. Maybe it was there all along. Maybe it's our imagination. Maybe it's real. Who knows? We have shown the picture to numerous confidants and simply asked, what do you see? Without fail, they all see the third party in our couple picture.
I visited Dudley Castle in England today with a friend, a very historically significant place, and apparently very haunted. The main attraction is the zoo, Dudley's zoological gardens and castle, but one of the enclosures, the castle creatures part, is within a section of the castle itself. There's a room that displays the history of the castle, and as we were reading the information, we both felt sort of uneasy, as if somebody was behind us. Note that the zoo was very empty today. My friend jumped away, saying that somebody had touched her arm. We stood for a second and moved on through the exhibition, feeling a little shaken, but in a sort of way excited too. As we nearly approached the bat enclosure, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, and a third shadow appeared behind us, as if somebody was striding toward us. We had seen absolutely nobody inside the enclosures, and the layout of the building means that the noises often echo throughout the tight halls, but there was nobody there. We quickly ran out of the enclosure, terrified but still kind of excited. Something else to note is that my mother has experienced some potentially paranormal activity in this building, specifically inside of the bat enclosure. As she went to leave, she backed away and said sorry to someone who was behind her previously, who apparently had disappeared. Both of my parents were adamant that there was somebody there that she nearly ran into, and then disappeared the second she turned to apologize. Apparently, these are common experiences. As I said, Dudley Castle is apparently very haunted, so I'm just curious if anybody else has ever had an experience there or if there are any potential explanations, paranormal or otherwise. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squire's is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now, it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it. The lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle, and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered, Nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera, one friend was recording video on his phone, and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, 
but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friends said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside, that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark. But on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs. And on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She said she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it. This happened a few years ago, but now it came back to my memory because of something I read recently. At the time of this, I was working for a private security company, and we were working at an event at Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. There were probably 10 to 15 of us scattered across the darkened castle in winter. It was really early in the morning, probably about 1 to 2 a.m., and a colleague and I picked the short straw of doing perimeter walk, where there is no light, not even from street lights nearby. So we have to do laps of the entire castle along the wall with the moat on our right hand side in near darkness, bar the torches that we were allowed to carry. As we approached our second lap near the longest stretch of the wall, 
I noticed footsteps in the darkness that weren't ours. We stopped a few times to check out this noise, but we could never pin it down to anything. It could have been an animal moving in the darkness, I suppose, but it just sounded strange. The next thing happened all within a few seconds, not really fast enough for us to respond. In the darkness, I noticed a figure of a man walking toward me. He was walking up from the moat to the right of us. As he approached, he said something along the lines of, Right Greeley, then walked straight past us into the solid 12-foot rock wall. In a complete state of shock, my colleague and I just confirmed with each other what we'd seen, that somebody had walked into a solid wall and vanished. Not gone over, not walked past, but walked directly into. We raised the alarm for an intruder just in case, but after a site-wide search, we never found anything of this guy who had walked up the slope. I work as a service manager at a Chipotle that is rather understaffed. As the manager, I'm the last one out, and due to staffing, that's usually pretty late. To make matters worse, I commute by bike, so I like to get changed when I finish all my work. This means I'm usually alone for at least 15 minutes in the basement of a strip mall, well after everyone else is gone. From the entire area, not just the restaurant. Because of this, I've heard strange noises and felt a presence behind me. And others have even mentioned being pushed down the stairs or have reported things being thrown down. We have cameras that look down the staircase and trust me, it's pretty weird to watch what happens. But the worst was that one night I was here alone until 2 a.m. doing a full inventory. The last employee left at 12.45. The building was locked down and there wasn't a single other person in the entire strip. But by 1.15, I heard a man and a woman arguing. The sounds were coming from the solid concrete walls. Around 1.30, I heard breathing coming up toward me, so I slammed the office door shut. That didn't stop the breath from coming up to my neck. I could feel pressure on my shoulders. That subsided at 1.50. At 2.10, I was getting changed in the storage room and took my bike out to set the alarm. The second I set the alarm, I hear the sounds of stomping boots running through the kitchen toward the back door, where I was currently in the process of getting out of there. I have never left a building so fast in all my life. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay, 
and was keeping me safe. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared in experiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pain. She would always come over to my bed in the night, complaining that she'd heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused and I told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't and begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was wrong. I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light, and I looked through her door. That was when I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the foot of her bed. It turned and looked at me. There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on, and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked, did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, did you see the tall dark thing at the foot of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I can't explain what we saw together that night so many years ago. She's convinced it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen. And personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. While the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. 
I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry and I left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle it lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. My boyfriend passed at the end of March, and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant, and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet, because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts in the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled back greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa 
and looks directly to our window doors looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought he maybe heard a fox or had been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Grandad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. Dark, but no fox. Then I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet still I heard breathing, quiet, but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted and it was my own breath, so I sat down. Yet it persisted and got slightly louder, and then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, but not louder. And it felt like that dizziness you get if you stand up too fast after sitting for a while. But that made no sense, as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to describe it, but it got worse, and I could feel myself panicking despite my best efforts to stay calm, which, surprisingly to me, did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room, and I stayed there for the rest of the night. What made it even worse, though, was that while I sat there, trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. I still can't explain it. I was driving home last night at about 1 a.m. It was already a full moon, so I was on high alert for any animals that might cross my path as I drive through a very rural area that's mostly dense forest on either side of the road for miles to get back. Anyway, as I was turning a corner, a deer jumped out in front of me. I slammed on my brakes and honked the horn. The deer ran into the forest on the opposite side of the road, and I sped up, rounding the corner. That's when the freaky stuff started happening. A tall white figure was standing at the edge of the woods. I didn't get a good look at it, because looking at it felt wrong, so I sped up. But it had a human shape, other than being about nine feet tall. I couldn't make out a face, but it was glowing slightly. After that, I sped up, hoping to get home as fast as possible. And the whole way home after that incident, my car kept making weird noises, and my radio had way more static than usual. Does anyone know what this could have been? I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister home alone. One day, we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in, and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace, when my sister said, what, from right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room, and she said no. I told my sister what happened, and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. My name is Luna, and I'm 35 years old, and I'm a hospice nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for the last 10 years. This is a story about a young woman I took care of that I became very close to. 
Patient in question was 23 years old and was dying of liver cancer. She was given about six months when she was told she was terminal and was put on hospice. I started going to her house twice a week at first and we really liked each other. As she started slowly going downhill, I started coming more and more until I was there every day. Most of the time, we would just sit and talk. She was a very pretty girl with long black hair and blue eyes. She was very athletic and active before she got cancer, so not being able to do things for herself or get up and around without help was very hard for her. She always wore a minty smelling perfume, which I liked very much. I was with her the day she died, and that was a very hard day for me. I got home pretty late that day, and I made dinner for myself, and sat down in the living room in front of the television. I had been sitting there for about five minutes, when I smelled a minty smell that was just like my patient's perfume. Then I heard a cough, and a female voice call my name. I looked over toward the kitchen, and there was my patient standing beside the kitchen counter. She just looked at me, and she was smiling, and then she waved and disappeared. I think it was just her way of saying she was okay. Sometimes to this day, I still feel like she's watching over me. Sometimes I still smell her perfume, especially if I've had a hard day. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual, but I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And true to his word, we never went back in there again. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. 
As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her, because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was.
I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. She bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, we're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy, while I was popular and in all honors and college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed, until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and teased that it would never happen, so that's why I mention this. In 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend to or understand the hiding of medications, thus leaving large amounts of all kinds of drugs just lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas in 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. 
It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman that he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was well known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase, separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying that her father would navigate my loss and that he would keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told him he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing by my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg which was tiny, and that was it, other than the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex spray paint that we were using. I told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him, or hallucinated him, or whatever, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So, thanks Josh for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but I decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights, 
because that's how I was raised. I would go to bed, and at some point, I'd open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover that I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I would lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up to greet her, only to find that I was still entirely alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this very clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession, then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while I was living there, but never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages had stopped flipping on the song, Hey You, and when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized that if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone in the other direction, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night, I had been out with a friend until around two o'clock in the morning. When I opened my door, I stepped in, and I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, oh, hi, Pink and I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. That's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but I never did. And actually, I never really talked to them at all. To answer some questions you might have, my roommate and I were and still are really good friends. We never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood, in a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I typically don't tell people this, because they usually don't believe me, and I would rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. 
I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement, gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, a hundred percent. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. And both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast and how I had ended up in the center of the pond since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. 
She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might've been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, 
because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know, though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by, and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal. But it's really hard to tell what happened. Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. 
She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park, and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in, because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around, and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen, and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look, because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out, and I went inside and locked up the church, and I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light, playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction, until I got a text from my friend. It said, Bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds, and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades, or even a century, continuing on with the work she had always done. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching, was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him, Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. 
I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did and he handed me another smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911 and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door so, when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him. 
and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time, I was wary of the room, though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now, back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, 
We're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross. I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school. It was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird, because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up. He rounded it and I followed suit, except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms, one for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it so I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and sat his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. When I was in my 20s, my then wife and I were standing outside a bakery waiting for it to open. There was also a family behind us in line, a father, a mother, a young boy, and a girl who was a little older. I remember the little boy because I thought it was odd that he was playing on the rounded metal railings on the opposite side of us, just climbing and hanging off of it like little kids do. The boy had brown hair and an oversized winter coat on. Nothing was said between my wife and I, and when the bakery opened, we went in, and so did the family. Except, there was no boy. I figured he was roaming an aisle or something, like kids do. So we check out, and so does the family, but still, no boy in sight. We walk out and get into the car, and notice the family leaving with just the daughter. I wasn't really thinking too much about it. 
until my wife says to me, where's the little boy? That's when I was a little shocked. We discussed the boy and what he looked like and how he was dressed, and we also talked about what he was doing on the railings while we waited. But there wasn't a boy anymore. This is a little bakery off a highway with no other stores around and no houses. The parking lot is also small and in plain view of the only entrance and exit door. We were both a little spooked and were not entirely sure if it was a ghost or some kind of glitch in the matrix. Like maybe we were seeing two different timelines or a parallel universe or something. But in any case, that boy just glitched out of existence. The last hour of my life has been really surreal for me. So I got off work just a little while ago and I ended up on Instagram, just kind of browsing the reels. I do this every now and then just for filler and it almost felt like my hands were just leading the way. Well, I ended up on this video of some girl and I liked her style, so I went to her page. I was just watching a few of her videos. For whatever reason, because I never do this, I clicked the comments, and I ended up clicking on the first commenter's profile. As soon as I do, I see the pictures of this person. I look up at the name. This profile belongs to a long-lost friend of mine that I went to elementary school with. I went to school in a very small town. My sixth grade class had fewer than 10 students. I haven't used Facebook in over six years, and even my Instagram doesn't have my real name attached to it. But when I found their profile, I instantly added them and sent them a message. We had no mutual friends, and they actually lived in another state, and had for the last 10 years or so. We messaged back and forth, and I found out that they had been having a hard time recently, but that they were trying to stay positive. I also found out that we both had similar outlooks, and we agreed that we were supposed to find each other again. I plan on calling them again this weekend to catch up more thoroughly, but holy crap, what a beautiful thing. Still, it seems like more than a coincidence. I don't know if it's a glitch in the matrix or something like that, but it was wild. Several months ago, I lost the last pair of glasses I had. I remember the last place that I had them, which was my friend's car, on my knee. I have to take them off in order to see my phone. I couldn't find them after I got home. I tore my house upside down looking for them. I even looked in the driveway, thinking that maybe I still had them on my knee when I got out of my car. I called my friend to look in his car but nothing. They had just vanished. Fast forward to last week, my husband and I do yard work for an elderly man, and we haven't been to his place to work in close to a year. He was out of state during that time, dealing with trying to sell a house out there. Anyway, we went to do his yard work last week, and my husband was taking and pulling weeds in one of the flower beds. He yells for me to come and take a look at something. I get to where he is and he's holding in his hands my glasses. He had just uncovered them buried in a flower bed. There's no possible way for them to have gotten there, much less to be buried under the dirt. I've been so shook over this and I would love to hear any ideas on how this could have happened. We're pretty sure it's some kind of glitch in the matrix, but dang, it was super weird. Let me preface this story by saying that when this happened to me, I, a 33-year-old male, was barely 16 and was as much of a skeptic or a believer as any kid at that age could be. I'd had other unexplained incidents before this, 
but this is the one that really stuck with me most of all. I went to bed in my very boring, very normal mid-2000s bedroom. I played a little Nintendo DS, later than I should have on a school night, I'll admit, then slept for maybe an hour or two before waking up in desperate need to use the bathroom. I roll out of bed, not bothering to grab my glasses. My first mistake, as someone who's literally legally blind without them probably should get them, and I take the muscle memory four steps diagonally across my tiled bedroom floor. I am a very tactile person due to my visual impairment, and I had my whole house, not only my room, memorized to a T for safety. I reached for my doorknob, and I get nothing. Okay, so maybe I'm not quite as awake as I thought. This never happens to me, though. I wake up if one of my parents so much as breathes wrong across the damn house, but okay, I guess I'm groggy. I reach to the left since I must have angled my walk wrong. Nothing. I try right. Nothing. Did I not walk far enough? I feel really awake now. I take another step, regretting the no glasses choice. I can barely make out shapes in the daytime and darkness is just a blanket over my eyes, so I can't see my door, or my bed, or my own hands in front of me. I can't see, period. But the door should be there. So where is it? I take another step. Two, three, four. I flail my arms forward, silently pleading, please let my door be there. And I swear I can see the nightlight in the hallway that's there so that I won't eat carpet on my way to the bathroom. Thanks, Mom. But no matter where I reach or how far I go, I can't get close enough. My memory gets hazy here, but after maybe two solid minutes of aimless walking toward the hazy outline of light around a door, my last thought from that between time was feeling that I was not at home. Then I'm in the hallway and I sleep on the couch the rest of the night. Looking into my room felt like staring into an abyss. Nothing ever came of it, but I don't know if anything will ever get under my skin the way this did. I felt so unsafe, so helpless and alien in that space that I had known so well. Wherever it was, it was not my room. I don't know if this would be a glitch, but I sure as hell don't have any other way to describe how or why this happened. My best friend and I are driving down this windy road in our town that has a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. We have the windows down, the music up, and we're just talking and laughing, all the usual things. I believe we were on our way to a mutual friend's birthday party. On this one specific part of the road, there's a relatively sharp turn that bends around a guardrail. If you were to drive through the guardrail, you would plummet a great distance before hitting the shallow river below. Mind you, I have been on this road countless times, and I have never been paranoid or imagined anything specific about this turn. It was just one of many places on this particular road that you had to slow down a good bit before continuing your way around. Nothing major. We start to approach the turn, and while in the middle of a discussion about some drama going on at the party we were on our way to, we both grab the sides of the seats, her one hand remaining on the steering wheel. At the exact same time, in the middle of a conversation that had nothing to do with the road. We weren't speeding, there were no cars around us at all. It was just a peaceful drive, not unlike any we've had previously or since. We glanced at each other with big eyes and pulled onto the side of the road after making it around the turn. After stopping, we immediately bring up the exact thing that we both pictured in our heads at the same exact time. She loses control of the wheel, which results in us smashing the guardrail and plummeting over the edge directly into the water. We both felt the same sensation of not being able to breathe correctly 
until we pulled the car onto the side of the road. And we felt a tingling sensation in the back of our head, a weird buzz in our ears. We both experienced the same exact thing at the same exact time, never happened to us before or since. It was, to say the least, extremely bizarre. I don't think I'll ever be able to make any sense of this experience, and I was on edge the entire night after this. I would love to hear any ideas on how or why this occurred. This happened in 2021. My family and I were living in a pretty old house at the time, like really old. There was mold, wood creaking in the middle of the night, and when the wind would blow, it sounded like the windows would shatter. I have three different things that happened at this house. My dad and I were driving back from a spirit Halloween store for Halloween decor because it was around that time of year. When we were walking up to our door, we heard a loud bang on the window, near the bottom right corner. We had cats at the time, but they never really jumped at the windows, and we checked. Two of them were asleep upstairs, and the other one was outside, nowhere near the window. My thought was maybe something had fallen and hit the window, but nothing was laying next to it. If you take the palm of your hand and you slap it on your window, it sounds exactly like what we heard. The second thing that happened to me was a little creepier. There were wooden floorboards that led from my kitchen to my living room. The kitchen had a tiled floor and the living room had carpet. Whenever you would walk through these wooden boards, they would make a mind-numbing creaking noise. Now, I've had my cats walk over these boards and they won't make a sound. And my cats are decently large and heavy. When I was home alone and sitting on my couch, I heard the floorboards make a noise. I've heard them make noises before, but this one sounded directional. I was obviously hesitant to go check, but eventually I did and there was nothing there. The third thing that happened is almost impossible for me to explain. I didn't see this one, but my dad did, and I didn't know this up until today. He walked into the kitchen and passed the countertop. As he walked, a small glass moved about four feet across the countertop, almost as though somebody had slid it. There was nobody in the house at the time except for me, my mom, and my dad, and we were not there, in the room. The windows may have been open, but even if they were, the wind couldn't have been enough to slide that glass across the table. This one is kind of a bonus, but not necessarily that creepy. I have a habit of speaking in my sleep. I've said really weird things before, like get the shovel or run. But my parents said that in this house in particular, they heard me scratching my wall in the middle of the night. My bed was pushed up against a wall and apparently my hand was in the air clawing at the wall. Another creepy thing happened too. My room is hallway adjacent to my parents. Apparently in the middle of the night, I sat up and blankly stared into their room. My dad looked over and asked me if I was all right. I didn't respond, but I put my hand up and waved, kind of like Forrest Gump in that one gif. I'm not sure if my house is haunted or if I'm possessed or both, but weird things are definitely happening here. My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get rich quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to and his ego unfortunately got in the way of making a living. At times he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, 
He invented and patented this newly engineered golf club and partnered with a few investors and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird-ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both naughty pine as well, a little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic, or even wanted to open the door, though. The door looked like it was meant for children, though, almost like an entrance to a treehouse or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that, and I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, no. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them, or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway and I feel the air get thick. Like, I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house, but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team. Cool, if I ever cared about football at all. It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late and we were told since it's Saturday, we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other, and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother and his back was to me. 
Then I go to look at the TV, which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan, and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV, and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down, and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later with my sister when we switched rooms because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards, and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started. The divorce happened. Dad moved out, and Mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school, and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time, and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme burrito with no beans that she always orders. I get home and she's in the living room and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, Hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to, and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first, you hear nothing, then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him, wondering who he is. You can't really tell what he's saying, only bits and pieces, but my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, please lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. My dad got sick of living with his own mother, and the house was in his name, so he legally kicked my mom out. And at this point, my older sister moved in with her fiance, and my other sister moved with mom, to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic. Until around 2007. 
He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big, solid oak sleigh bed, and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, fate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room. A greaser type, with slick back hair and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic and everyone heard that metal against concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left. And when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying no before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the naughty pine room caught a woman saying, crawl out, you have to crawl out. There were growls. There were snarky remarks said in the basement and a man's voice saying, where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel. You're dead, it's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us in my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still, and we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange.
There's a little boy that inhabits my mom's house. My mom has owned her home for 18 years now. There have always been small, bizarre occurrences around the house, the kind that you can explain away or simply ignore. Things falling off of counters or going missing, strange noises or that feeling of being watched, footsteps down the hallway all the time. We never talked about it, and I never felt scared or even had any idea that our house was actually haunted. Until one night. The bathroom at the house is located at the very end of a long hallway, and my bedroom is directly next to it. It was summertime, and I was about 14 or 15, that age where you would stay up talking to your friends on the phone all night. I was on the phone with my best friend. It was 4 a.m., when I distinctly heard footsteps running down the hallway, into the bathroom, and the bathroom light clicks on. Immediately, I get up to check out what's going on, thinking that maybe it's one of my younger sisters. If somebody like my younger sister was running to the bathroom at 4 a.m., obviously something is wrong and I wanted to help. Maybe 10 seconds elapsed before I look into the bathroom. There's nobody there, and the light is on. I check on my sisters and my mom. Everybody in the house is sleeping like the dead. I'm absolutely horrified, and my friend on the phone experienced the whole thing with me. The next day I told my mom. She tells me that she knows the house is haunted by a little boy in a red sweater, because she has seen him herself running down the hallway. Years later, my stepdad on one end of the hallway and my mom on the other both see him again, the boy in the red sweater. He yells like a child playing and runs down the hallway into the bathroom, and then he disappears. Something about this is just inherently sad to me, the idea of a child stuck in a purgatorial loop. What was he running from? What was he running to? Who is he, or who was he? And what happened to him? I live in a relatively old house in Scotland. I have always felt another presence at home, and I have believed in the paranormal since forever. It all started when my sister and I heard the floorboards creak in the middle of the night. When she went to check, nobody was there, and the entire family was fast asleep. A little while later, I woke up and I saw a little girl in my room just looking at me, before literally jumping and never seeing her again. Until recently, I always thought that I had tricked myself into imagining her as I remember dreaming about a child and playing with this girl. The other day, my sister heard a little girl giggling. She's the only girl in the house now. When she told me, I instantly connected this to seeing the little girl. But perhaps this could explain more occurrences as well. My sister once told me a while back that sometimes when she looks out of the corner of her eye at the doorways, she would see a shadowy figure darting from room to room. I didn't really believe her. Well, until it happened to me. I was sitting in my parents' bed because I sleep in a closet-sized room with no Wi-Fi, and I glanced up to see this shadowy figure skip into the bathroom. I immediately went to check to see if anybody was there, and to my surprise, the room was empty. But nothing will ever scare me as much as what happened about a year ago. I woke in the middle of the night or early morning, which is very unusual for me. I should mention that I sleep facing the wall as I hate being open to the rest of my room. I laid on my back for a brief second or two before hearing three perfectly synced and identical claps. At the time, I assumed some robber or burglar was checking to see if I was awake, so I bolted under the sheets and faced the wall, lying motionless as I was terrified. My brother and sister were away at the time, so I was home alone with my parents. In the morning, I asked them if it was them, and they said no. My parents have never been sleepwalkers or anything of the sort. 
After doing some research, I found out that apparently ghosts clap to communicate sometimes. My biggest regret is not looking to see who, or what, was clapping. My whole family believes me though, excluding my skeptical brother. Can anyone explain this? Or has anyone experienced anything like it? I'd love to know. I live in a small town in Canada, and my house was built in 2007. Before that, it was farmland. My great-grandmother and her kids immigrated here from Ecuador in the 70s. Throughout my family's bloodline, every woman in the family is believed to have had some kind of sixth sense. My great-grandmother's sister was a powerful medium. My grandmother's older sister is also a medium and reads palms. My mother does tarot readings and informs me on her past experiences with ghosts when she lived in Toronto with my grandmother and great-grandmother. Ever since I was a baby, I've been seeing ghosts everywhere. My grandma told me that I would point to the corner and talk to it like somebody was there. I'm 16 now, and I've been living in this house for the past 15 years. Paranormal experiences have happened to me here for as long as I can remember, so it's just a normal thing now. My mom doesn't encourage me thinking about those things, though. She tells me it's all in my head. A month ago, my dad's parents came up from Texas to renovate our basement. On their last day, my grandpa told me that he thought our basement was haunted because of all the voices he was hearing near the cold room. I told my mom about this, and she lowered her voice and told me that she had lied to me. She had said that it was all in my head, but she'd been telling me that to protect me. It wasn't all in my head, and that I had been seeing ghosts. She used to keep me in her room as a child and pray to God to keep the spirits away from me, because she saw them too. So far, I've noticed one ghost or entity or something that keeps reappearing in different places. I first saw her when I was eight or nine. My cousin and I saw her in my closet. She had pale skin, long blue-black hair, and wore a deep blue dress. The most notable feature is that her nails were painted a shiny metallic blue that glistened in the dark. She held out her hand to us and we ran away. The second time was when I was 11. At the time I had a loft bed that was up near my ceiling. My bedroom is on the second floor. I was lying in bed after coming home from school and I saw that lady slowly walk by my window. Her nails were still painted that shiny blue. It was the most notable ghost I've ever seen. Ghost in quotations, because I'm not really sure if that's what she is. Apart from that, my younger brother and I, Lex, both saw a glass cup on our table slowly slide over to the other side of it. I always see figures in my room and hear music in the shower drain. My entire family hears people talking in our bedrooms. My brother and I have started to wake up with long scratches all over us. The house was blessed by a priest when it was made, but I don't think it worked, or maybe it wore off. I'm getting scared, and I don't know what to do. Update. We had a priest from our local church come to bless our house again, but I don't think it was effective. A few weeks ago, I had the house to myself with my brothers, while my parents and grandparents were out. Lex and I were watching TV in the living room when we saw our youngest brother, Michael, age 10, sprint out of the washroom and into the dining room, which isn't visible from where we were. We didn't think anything of it until Michael came out of his bedroom on the second floor to get snacks. We were absolutely terrified and retreated upstairs. Maybe I'm just doomed to live in a house with ghosts. In 
If you like haunted houses, you would love my dad's home. It's a two-story brick home built by a family back in the 1840s. It was owned by the same family until my dad bought it. There's a rumor that it has a tunnel entrance on the property because of the Underground Railroad. I lived there by myself for several years during college. Dad lived with his girlfriend. Paranormal stuff happened on the daily, so much so that it was just routine. Footsteps throughout the house and going up and down the stairs during the day was typical, but mostly at night and in the early morning. If it was at night, I would usually just turn up the TV. Several times, I was woken up by a man who shouted, Hey! When I'd look around, a man's silhouette could be seen leaning casually against the doorway of my room. I got the feeling that this ghost didn't like me, but I didn't really give a damn and I would just roll back over and go to sleep. Often, I would also wake up to the feeling of my bed shifting, as though somebody had sat down. Once I felt something rub my back, not in a malicious kind of way, more like a motherly way. I'll also experience very strong and sudden aromas. They'll come out of nowhere and last just for a few seconds. Usually it's cigar smoke, my dad and I don't smoke, old ladies perfume, or freshly baked bread. Items would always go missing and then magically reappear in other areas of the house. You never, ever feel alone. You always see somebody just out of the corner of your eye. I had to keep the blinds closed because I kept seeing somebody walk across our front or back porch, but nobody would ever be there. I always got the feeling that if you glanced at the top of the stairway, you would see somebody standing there. Very often I would hear feminine humming. It definitely had tune and inflection. It wasn't our central heating or air conditioning or anything mechanical like that. After a particularly active paranormal night, the next morning there was a random dirty, rusty, handmade nail about three inches long laying on its side outside of my bedroom. The only time I felt genuinely scared was when I was playing a video game at about 4 p.m. I heard the front door open and my dad whistled his distinctive whistle. I heard footsteps and keys being placed on the counter. Without looking up from the game, I said, Hey dad, I didn't know you were coming here today. I would have ordered pizza or something. He didn't answer me, and I thought maybe he just didn't hear me. So I paused my game and went into the kitchen. It was totally empty. No keys on the counter, his shoes weren't by the door. The door was locked and his car was not in the driveway. I thought, wow, kind of rude for him to leave so soon. So I called him and said, where'd you go in such a hurry? Dad sounded confused. I haven't left work. I'll be here late tonight. My dad works about an hour and a half away. There's probably more things that I just can't remember right now. My friends have all hated that house and they would never come over. Whenever family comes over, they get weirded out by the vibes which is strange because most of them don't believe in these things. I grew up in Southern Pennsylvania, not far from Gettysburg. When I was eight years old, my parents decided to build a house on vacant property surrounded by fields, and it was beautiful. I lived with both of my parents and my two older brothers, who were 15 and 17 at the time. Though I grew up in the area, we only stayed in this house for four years. My first night there was not what I expected it to be. I was laying in my bed and had just closed my eyes. Then I heard a voice that sounded like a soft whisper about six inches from my face, say, help, help, over and over, just repeating the same word until I finally fell asleep. I tried my best to forget about it, because I thought there was no way the house could be haunted. It was brand new. Certainly I was just tired. About a month goes by, and I'm sitting on my bed, doing what I used to love doing most, 
which was Reed. I glanced up and looked at my doorway because I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. At that moment, I had officially seen a full-body apparition of what appeared to be a soldier from the 1800s, but he didn't see me. He was just walking by my room very slowly. I still remember every detail of his appearance 20 years later. He was covered in blood and looked like he'd been shot or stabbed. This lasted for about five seconds. Still being creeped out, my curiosity got the best of me, and I walked out of the room and searched all over the house, but I found nothing unusual. About a week or two goes by, and I'm in my bed, trying to fall asleep yet again, only to be disturbed before I even had the chance to close my eyes. This voice was very deep and masculine. I couldn't understand a word it was saying because it was speaking in a different language. It sounded annoyed and angry. It happened every night at the exact same time for two weeks before it suddenly and inexplicably stopped. After that, I had a night terror. I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I had woken up in the middle of the night and I could see what looked like a tarantula crawling on me in bed. I swear it was there. I definitely saw it. I was panicking. My dad came in the room to check on me and found that everything was okay. No spider. Before I could fall asleep though, I heard what sounded like two men laughing right next to my bed. At this point, I was getting used to all the messed up things that were happening. One summer, I stayed up late every night so I could watch Hannah Montana at midnight. One night, when the clock struck midnight, I heard my back door downstairs open. Then I would hear a woman say my name, as if she was calling for me or looking for me. I'd hear the door shut, followed by footsteps, and then there would be silence. This happened every night for almost two months. It never failed. It didn't even bother me at this point. I knew it wasn't my mother because she worked 12 hour night shifts at the hospital almost every night. There were no other females around, but one night it too stopped altogether. I was up at midnight and nobody had called my name. I went to sleep and everything felt peaceful for once. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my bedroom door. I looked at the clock on my cable box. It was 3 a.m. I assumed that it was one of my brothers and I told them to go away, but then the doorknob started turning, but it wouldn't open because the door was locked. I have always slept with my bedroom door open, always, and I definitely wasn't the one who locked it. The knocking and doorknob rattling went on for what felt like forever, and then it stopped. A few minutes later, I hear what sounds like scratching at the door. I think to myself, what the heck? Is it my cat? But then the knocking, scratching, and turning of the handle start happening at the exact same time. No way in hell my cat could do all three at once, let alone the knocking and turning of the doorknob. It would happen for about 30 seconds, and then it would stop. It happened at least five times. Sometimes the knocking would be so hard it sounded like pounding, and my whole door was shaking. Whatever was on the other side of that door really wanted to come in. It got so bad that it woke my dad up. He heard all of the commotion, and as soon as he opened his bedroom door, it all stopped, instantly. He called out to me, but I was too afraid to say anything. He went back into his room and closed the door, but the same scenario repeated itself three more times. My dad made me sleep in his room. We never spoke about it ever. Things seemed to be fine for a while. Then whatever was in my house struck again. My brother had gotten up to go to the bathroom. He turned the hallway light on, noticed that my bedroom door was closed as it was across the hall from the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the hallway light is off and my bedroom door was wide open. He looked inside my room and saw me still sleeping. Everyone else in the house was sleeping. 
He woke my dad and brother and told them what had happened. They searched the house for a possible intruder, but found nothing. More months go by and we are all awoken by our smoke detector going off in the middle of the night. We all go downstairs in a panic, just to find out that the stove was on, full blast, big flames on top of the stove, in the middle of the night. What the hell? One day, it was just my father and I. My mom was at work, as usual. My oldest brother was at work, and my other brother was at baseball practice. I'm downstairs, but I hear what sounds like somebody running upstairs. Forgetting that both of my brothers aren't home, I go up the stairs and see somebody run into my brother's room and slam the door. It was loud. I thought for sure it was my brother, and I wanted to go in there and see what he was up to and why he would be running around like that. I opened the door and nobody was there. I watched the door close right in front of me. I felt sick to my stomach just standing there realizing that the only other person that was home was my father, and he was in the shower. I continued to see weird things all the time. One day, in the middle of the day, I saw my German Shepherd run upstairs full blast as if she was chasing something, but I never saw what she was chasing. Whatever it was went under the bed, and she was viciously growling at it. At first I thought it was my cat, until I saw him sitting on top of the bed. It appeared that he had been sleeping until we burst in and woke him up. One night, my cousin was spending the night. We were walking through the living room when she saw the reflection of another person on the glass of our big bookcase. Another time, we were in my backyard, and she told me that she saw somebody looking at us through the window. I guess this happened on a few occasions, but it wasn't anybody we knew. My brothers almost never had friends over, so that was not a possibility. I remember one day I was walking down the basement stairs. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw what looked like another apparition, except the apparition looked exactly like my older brother, but it also didn't look human. It was almost white and blue, and his eyes were pure black, like something trying to be him. When he saw me, his eyes got really big and he looked terrified and ran away and went into the crawl space. I ran upstairs to find out that my brother wasn't even home. I never went back down there after that. A few months later, I was with the same brother and we were in the living room watching George Lopez late at night. I'm into the show, but he muted the TV. He looked at me and said, did you hear that? I told him no, I hadn't heard anything. We sat still for a minute, and then I did hear it. Together, we both heard footsteps coming up the basement stairs. My brother grabbed a baseball bat, and we went to the basement to investigate, but to no avail. The rest of our family was sleeping upstairs. The next night, my mom was up late at night sitting at the dining room table, doing whatever it was she was doing. Around 3 a.m., the shelf in the dining room flew off the wall and put a hole in the wall that was adjacent to it. We looked at the nails in the wall that had held the shelf in place, and they were still perfectly straight. We moved out of that house when I was 12. I still experience paranormal things, but nothing that comes close to what I dealt with in that house. I believe there were a lot of spirits there and I'd love to know about what happened there previously to cause so much activity. We were a regular church-going family, so I'm sure if there was anything demonic there, that probably pissed it off even more. But I don't know. What do you think it could have been? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? All of the above? What's your story? Back in the 90s, my parents would often move from house to house. Before I was born and they were pregnant with my sister, they moved into a new house complete with a lake in the backyard. It was pretty old, but still comfy. My parents thought it was all fine until some strange things began to happen. 
For starters, they said that when taking showers, the radio would often switch to random static noises, the lights would flicker, and hair dryers would just shut off suddenly. All right, no big deal. Just an old house. Nothing strange at all. Of course, my parents started speculating some strange things were happening after living in it for a few months. One night, they had some friends over. This picture of a little boy was hanging on the wall, overlooking the living room. My parents joked around and talked about how it was evil or something. Just as they did that, all of the lights turned off, as if on cue. One night, both of them were sitting in bed, trying to fall asleep. My mom told me that while sleeping, this weird blowing noise blew right in her ear. She said something like, stop doing that, thinking that it was my dad. He said, I'm not doing anything. They both felt this weird blowing noise in their ear, like right next to their ears. I would honestly be terrified too. Then finally, after having crazy and terrifying experiences, the last thing that happened was their breaking point. When getting home with groceries, the magnets on the fridge were strangely arranged differently than they had been before. Not only that, but while getting all of the bags out of the car, my mom swore that she saw a shadow flash by in the living room. My dad looked over and said that he saw it too. They both called the police thinking it was an intruder, but when the police arrived, they couldn't find anything. They ended up living there only six months. That was the last straw. When they moved out, there were some rumors going around that supposedly somebody had died in that lake behind their yard. When they came back to see the house a little while later, it had been condemned. First, I want to talk about the recent experience I had at my house while I was trying to astral project. I was laying down, doing the techniques, when I suddenly hear somebody breathing right next to me and my dog. At first I thought it was my dog, since sometimes he moves around in his sleep. And I think he has nightmares. While I'm hearing the breathing, I look at my dog, but I can hear him breathing and it's a different pattern than the one that was right next to me. My next experience haunts me to this day. I was in bed when my dad and I hear the gate button being pressed. It connects to an iPad. We ran downstairs to investigate since we suspected that it might be the police. We open the app to see that it's a black screen. Peculiar, but it was because of the Wi-Fi. For some extra context, the gate camera will snap a photo of the person who pressed the button to be let in. It took two photos. My dad and I went to the windows to see any lights, but there were none. There was nobody in the photo. The next experiences somewhat relate to each other. This happened when I was walking home from school. I was strolling down my road when I hear someone yell, hey. I turned to see if it was my neighbor, since we have a few houses on the small patch of road. No one was there. I walked next door to see if anybody was home there, but nobody was. The second thing that happened was I was walking in the forest on my property. I was walking on this little trail when I hear snap, not like a twig. It sounded like a firm finger snap. We have tenants down in the yard, but how they could snap so close to me when no one was there is beyond me. It had to have been somebody standing right next to me. It wasn't an echo or anything like that, but nobody was there. The last experience has given me a wider sense of the paranormal. I was dragging the lawnmower when I hear an old woman's voice say, Hey, I turn to see nobody there. So I keep dragging it. Then I hear, stop. It was so loud that I dropped everything and had to look. Nobody was there. I want to be honest. We do have a tenant downstairs, but why would she be yelling at me? I kept dragging the mower, and then I heard mumbling, and then the voice disappeared. What's even creepier is that my neighbor's grandmother lived in this house. When she died, 
I think he just decided it was better off cutting the property in half, sell one side, my house, and then make his house on the other. So maybe it was her thinking that I was him or not being happy I was in half of her house. In any case, it's definitely been interesting. I bought my first house nine months ago. It's a huge accomplishment for me. On the evening after I closed on the house, I had a little champagne toast in the new place. I invited my boyfriend, my sister, we'll call her Jenna, her four-year-old daughter, we'll call her Mary, my best friend, Aunt T, and my son and brother who live with me. It only lasted an hour or two. I gave everyone the tour. My best friend and Jenna wanted to stop in every room and talk about my plans for it. I ordered pizza. Like I said, we had a small champagne toast. My niece, Mary, had a great time running through the house. She and my sister have a 700 square foot apartment, so my place seemed huge to her. Mary loved my room. I have a closet in my room with a built-in pedestal kind of thing, so we sat her on it and joked that it could be her room. All in all, it was a good time. Everyone who didn't live there headed out at about the same time, starting with Jenna and Mary. It was a school night after all. Not even five minutes after Jenna and Mary left, my sister calls me, still driving home. She sounds shaken, and I was worried for a second that her car had broken down or she got into an accident, but no. Jenna said that she had asked Mary if she'd had a good time and if she liked Aunt Dee, that's me, and my new place. Mary said, yeah, I had fun with Aunt Dee, Aunt T, and the little girl. My sister said she actually pumped the brakes on the car because her instinct was to stop the car in its tracks. The thing is, there were no other children in the house that night, just Mary. Jenna's not trying to scare Mary, but she wants to know more. So very gently, she asks, Oh, what little girl? Mary says, The one that was standing behind Aunt Dee all night. My sister presses her a little more and asks Mary what the little girl looks like. Mary says she has long black hair and she had on a pretty blue dress. My sister asked if the little girl had spoken to her. Mary said no, she was really shy, but they had fun chasing each other through the house and the little girl was sitting in her house, AKA my closet, when we opened the door. Mary hesitated to walk into the closet at first and I didn't know why, now I know. So apparently I have a little ghost girl in my house. She likes my closet and me. My house was built in 1900, so it does have a long history, but I haven't looked into it yet. I haven't heard or seen a thing in this house since I moved in but I did not sleep well for the first few nights. The ghetto where I'm from is divided by a golf course. One side of the street is project housing, and the other side is nicer homes built in the 30s to 90s, before the projects were there. I lived in a 1934 two-bedroom house, bright yellow tile. I was 26, and I lived with my girlfriend who was 24. After living there a few months, my girlfriend started saying she felt uneasy in the hallway, which was very small and had a crawl space in the ceiling. I brought my dad over to get up there and take a look because, you know, could be something scary up there. He found nothing except insulation. A while later, I took a nap for about two hours. My girlfriend was in the next room folding laundry after work. She comes to wake me up, shaking my shoulder. She asks how long I'd been asleep. I said a couple of hours. She said, so you didn't just walk through the house? I said, no. She said, but I just saw you walk through the hallway. 
I asked if she was sure, and she said yes. I told her it wasn't me, and there's no one else in the house. Fast forward a year. I'm trying to quit smoking, and I lost my vape. My buddy had been staying at my house for a couple of weeks, and he's helping me look for my vape. I walk out to the car, and I get in the driver's seat. I'm digging between the seat and the gear shift, and suddenly, something or someone is talking into my ear. Not whispering, speaking, right into my left ear. There's that SOB right there, it says. I'm frozen. It's the dead of night. Nobody is around. My buddy is still inside. After about a minute of complete silence, I finally open the car door and go back inside. I tell him what just happened. That's when he goes, huh, probably the same person that calls my name at night. What? He'd been hearing somebody say his name from behind him on the couch he slept on at night ever since he started staying with me. I'm creeped out, but not enough to move. The rent was great, and I was not easily shaken. Fast forward a few months. My mom comes over to pick me up and to go shopping. I throw on a shirt in front of the hallway and say, Hey, how does this look for today? My mom turned around, and her eyes go over my head. She starts to back up and tries to adjust her eyes. I said, What? She said that a black shadow had just gone up the wall behind me into the room behind me. I thought, oh, so now there's that. Fast forward a few months more and I'm watching TV in the living room with my buddy. We hear a loud bang. We go into the kitchen and all the cabinets are open. A single jar of Nutella is on the floor and a huge hole has been punched in the wall beside the refrigerator. Interesting, but I'm still not leaving. Fast forward a few more months. My buddy moved out, my girlfriend and I broke up, and she moved. I was living there alone for the first time. I go to lay down one night. My bed was freshly made, so the covers were tight. I cut the light and laid my head back. Suddenly, there's pressure on either side of my feet, like someone has one hand beside each side of my foot and is pressing down, as if you're looking over top of me. It lasted all of 30 seconds before I sat up and turned the light back on. Nothing there. Still not moving. Fast forward. I get a new girlfriend. She starts staying over. She says she sees faces in the mirror in the hallway. I'm like, yeah, weird things happen here. Nothing has ever tried to harm me, so I stay. This goes on for a couple of months, until one day I come home to my girlfriend on the porch. It's dark. She says she will not go back in that house while I'm gone. She convinces me to move. I'm in love. I want her to be comfortable. So we're in our new house and I'm on my laptop, going through old photos and videos that I took at the old house. I find videos of myself being recorded from my laptop, but I'm not pressing record. It was videos of me watching TV, working out, leaving my bedroom and walking through the house. It stops all on its own. All of the videos were about a minute or so long. I went to the courthouse and found records where the owner and also the town sheriff had died there of old age. And the community seems to believe that there was some kind of brothel there at some point, due to a red light on the porch. I'm sure that was just a rumor. One of the neighbors said someone had shot themselves in the house, but I couldn't find a record of that either. I wish I could go on about other instances at the old haunted house, but I've gone on long enough. It was 2009 to 2013, rent was 625, and honestly, I wish I had never left. I grew up in a haunted house through my childhood years and when I was a young adult. Sometimes I wonder if it was real or just in my head, but I wanted to talk about it. Heads up, there is some mention of animal death in this story, so if that's not your thing, 
Maybe don't listen to or read it. Anyway, when I was a very young child, I lived in a very old house. I think the house was originally built in the early 1900s. It was originally a doctor's office and home. Right next door was the town's hospital. The house was originally a one-story, one-bedroom, one-bath house and was later turned into a three-bedroom, one-bath, one-story house in 1960. I live in fear in that house. All you felt living in that house was fear and nothing else. I would either look down at the floor or close my eyes if I had to get up and walk to the bathroom. I always felt watched. And sometimes when I walked into the kitchen to get to the bathroom, something invisible would come up and hit me or my body or I'd be checked to the side. It would also happen if you stood at the kitchen sink. Something invisible would come from nowhere and body check you to the side. Then we had our dad's old non-battery operated plug-in radio that would turn itself on all the time. Even when it wasn't plugged in, it would still go on, all on its own. It did for years and we just got used to it. But then we had a social worker therapist lady come for a visit. We came and sat down at the kitchen table to talk about the radio turning on with the lady there. I tried to do my best to ignore it, but I couldn't, and I had to explain to the lady what happened. She was actually okay with it. Apparently it wasn't her first time with the paranormal, so that was cool. Years go by and I'm home alone taking a bath. Out of the blue, the front door opened and slammed shut and I could hear somebody stomping all the way through the house and into the kitchen, and then stop. I got out of the tub quickly, covered myself with a towel, and then threw the bathroom door open. No one was there. I was still home alone. You can't break into my dad's house. My dad put in key entry only locks and hard bar grids over the outside of the windows. The living room windows were triple paned and the bedroom windows were double paned. That house was like Fort Knox. Again, a few years later, my big sister lost her keys one day. She always put them in the same spot every day, but that one day when she went to get them, they just weren't there. We searched everywhere for the keys, and when we finally stopped looking, the keys showed back up in the same spot they should have been in to begin with. The second time they disappeared, they were found outside on the ground in the drive. It was outside the fence. There was no reason for them to be there. The third time the keys went missing, they weren't found until many years later, inside the compartment in the dashboard area below the radio of the car. She didn't find them, but the car dealership that she took the car into to trade it in found them. That was pretty creepy. The house, or the negative thing in the house, turned Dad into a very negative person. He went from an awesome dad to a very abusive dad over the years. I took the brunt of that abuse because I was the youngest and the most sensitive to the paranormal. He never abused my big sister, just me. The negative thing in the house also grabbed dad and body checked him a few times, but he kept that to himself for years until we no longer lived there. One time when I was home alone in the house, I was standing in front of the kitchen, but kind of standing sideways, because the kitchen stove was next to the sink. Something in the living room, in front of the pellet, caught my attention, and when I turned to look, I saw this mist or fog come up through the floor in front of the pellet stove and start moving toward the first bedroom. That was mine and my sister's bedroom, and then it just disappeared in front of me. Oh, and this is the best one. When I came back home for a little bit when I was a young adult, my sister and I had a bed together for a few nights. But one night in bed, my sister in her sleep just sits in my bed right next to me. As soon as she laid down next to me, a very bright young man came up through the bed on my sister's side of the bed, leaned over her and grabbed my right leg below my knee. I wasn't asleep at all, and I was just laying there wide awake. I couldn't sleep because at that time, I was pregnant with my first son. But yeah, I could see the outline of this young man. He looked like a high school quarterback, slim, tall, biceps. 
He lit up the room. He was that bright. After he disappeared, I looked at the radio clock in our room. The time was 3.47 in the morning. We also had something in the house kill two of our cats with antifreeze. Someone opened a brand new bottle and dumped it in the corner of the house. Nobody was home when it happened. You needed a key to get into that house. One cat died right away, the other two weeks later. It was slowly killing two more of our cats. We could never keep pets in the home. They all started to die shortly coming back home. Years later, dad and sister moved out and he rented it to a friend from work. We had a six foot tall, large dog kennel in the back. The guy put his bulldog inside and chained him in the kennel. Then he locked it up and left for a few hours. Later, he found his dog hanging on the opposite side of the gate by its chain. Obviously, he was dead. That's never happened before, and we had two dogs in that thing before, and they were even bigger than the bulldog. We were all completely shocked when that happened. Even the work friend became a very negative person after moving into that house. To this day, I want nothing to do with that place. It now sits completely abandoned. Dad can't sell it, which honestly is probably for the best. It's not safe for anyone to live in. I was 13, soon to be 14, when I moved into this house. I was always very connected to the spiritual world because my mom was a very strong believer, and I was very curious about this topic. Everything was quite normal when we moved in, even though I had a weird feeling about a corner in my parents' room. That corner gave me a feeling of fear. Whenever I came into my parents' room, I got this unwelcoming feeling and an urge to leave, but I didn't think too much of it until I started to feel like I was being watched whenever I was home alone. The first time I really thought about the house being haunted was when my mom told me that for a second, she had felt like time stopped and she heard a male voice asking for help. At first I thought she was just trying to scare me, but she was genuinely very concerned about it. Even though that was pretty scary, my mom and I decided not to pay attention. We thought that if we just ignored it, it would stop and go away. A few months passed and nothing happened, at least nothing like what my mom had experienced. I still felt like I was being watched and I just couldn't stay in my parents' room, but the energy was really off. I was really depressed and my mom and dad started to fight a lot. My mom and I started to fight too, my mom was also feeling depressed, and our life just took a downhill turn since we moved. Everything got worse when one of my cats died. After my little buddy died, I started to feel the strong smell of cigarettes and men's perfume and a masculine energy around the house. It wasn't the perfume or cologne that my dad used. My mom came to me asking if I had started smoking. And I said, no, of course not, but that I had smelled the same smells as well. Then my mom told me that she had started to have these weird dreams about a man. I have to admit that while I felt very afraid of what was going on, I also felt this weird excitement to know more. And I started to do more research about paranormal activity. Now, I don't know if that triggered it to get worse or not, but boy, did it. I was now constantly feeling observed and oppressed. Then, one afternoon, when I was home alone, I was talking to my friend on the phone when I suddenly heard a loud noise coming from the front door. My dog started barking like crazy, and I immediately thought that somebody was trying to break in. I slowly went there to see what was going on, and I quickly discovered that there was nobody outside. I really started to freak out. I went back into the living room and continued to talk to my friend to calm down. I hear another loud noise. The door of my parents' room had just closed itself. I opened it to see if the window was open, trying to find an excuse for what had just happened. But the window was closed. At this point, I was losing it. When my mom got home, I told her what had happened. She told me to just ignore it. That if there was something in the house, 
it was just trying to scare me, and that if it was bad, it would feed on my fear. I thought that what she said was just a little too Hollywood, honestly, but I still followed her advice and played it cool. A little bit after that, on another afternoon, I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up with a loud, A, in my ear. It was the voice of my mom. And I swear to this day, I can still hear the voice of my mom in my head, crystal clear. I even thought that my mom was already at the house, but it turned out there was no one there. Then another cat died. Two years at the house and two of my cats had died. If I'm being honest, all I could think about was how in horror movies the pets always die. I was terrified of the house. I avoided it at all costs, and I didn't like to be home alone. I just couldn't handle the fear at this point. I constantly felt watched. I couldn't even go to the bathroom at night. It's like I wasn't even living in my house. I just felt extremely unwelcomed there. Then my mom started to have dreams about all of us being dead, and we always died in the worst types of ways. I was also having very vivid dreams. Some of them I remember clearly to this day. My mom then decided to do a cleansing to the house, and everything calmed down for a while. Then my mom told me that when she was trying to put my little sister to sleep, she made a gesture like she was offering her pacifier to someone. And when she asked her, she told her she was offering it to the lady. My mom completely froze and didn't say anything. I wasn't sure what to think anymore. And by now, those things just started to feel really normal. I was scared, but curious. And I wanted to see something, not just hear it or feel it. Through the whole time that this was going on, I felt excited to see something. Even though I wasn't sure how I would react, I still wanted it. Well, that day came when I was trying to sleep in my room. Everything was dark, and I was facing the ceiling just whispering the lyrics of a song to try to get to sleep. I wasn't thinking about anything paranormal. And the funny thing is, in the moment when things were happening, I was never even thinking about the paranormal as a cause either. But I saw this light come from the corner of my room. I quickly looked and faced it. And I felt it looking back. Even though it was just a light, I could feel some kind of presence in it. When I processed what it was, I gasped, and it moved fast to the left, then to the right, then disappeared. When I tell this, it seems like it lasted minutes, but the truth is it only lasted for a couple of seconds. It was super fast. I can't really explain what I saw. It was like a lantern, but alive. I don't really know. It was white, and unlike the other things that happened, this one actually didn't make me feel scared. I did a little Google search after that, and I found out that what I had seen is typically called an orb, and the color white meant protection. At this point, I was very confused, but I had this feeling that the thing that I had seen was not the thing that was scaring me. I thought of my uncle who passed away when I was seven. Maybe the orb was him protecting me from whatever was in the house. Maybe not. All I know is that after that, everything calmed down. This was the last event that I can remember, and it happened in the very last year that I lived in the house. Shortly after all this, I moved. But now and then I think about that home. Why could I never go into my parents' room? Who was the man that asked my mom to help and appeared in her dreams? Was it him that made everything smell like cigarettes and cologne? Who was the lady? I never got any answers to these questions. One month after I moved, I had a dream. I was in my bed and I knew I was sleeping, but I could see my room perfectly. And I remember thinking that a bad entity was there. Then I saw a very bright light that covered my vision and I woke up feeling very protected. I think that was the last time that I felt like something was with me, at least at my house where I still live until this day. I have a lot of weird stories that have happened to me but anyway, I moved to the haunted house when I was almost 14 and left when I was almost 18. And never for a second did I think I was crazy, even though nobody believed me other than my mom. 
And I get it. It sounds like scary movie stuff. But I hope you'll feel differently and actually believe my story. Because it did happen. And I still really miss my cats. My friends lived a few houses down in an old house they were renting. They often talked about the house being haunted. They said that things would move by themselves or disappear, only to reappear later. They mostly talked about this pair of jeans that was set out when my friend was getting ready for work. When he went to go get them, they were gone. He figured he must have forgotten and just set them down elsewhere, so he started looking around. He couldn't find them, so he just got a different pair and then went to work. When he came home, they were folded up on the kitchen table. He asked his wife where she had found them. She said she hadn't seen them. They went to the kitchen and she claimed she has no idea how they got there. One time, I walked over to their house and I was going in the side door. As I reached for the doorknob, I saw it twist and open up, just a few inches. I thought it was them telling me to come in, so I waited for them to say something. After a few seconds, I opened the door and went in. I said hello and waited. Then I went into the house looking for them and calling them. That's when I realized the house was empty and they weren't home. I got this really funny feeling, and then I started to leave. And that's when I heard a baby crying in their bedroom. I thought, what in the world is going on? But I walked into the bedroom and the crying stopped and there was no baby. I got out of there as fast as I could. They later told me that that was the kind of stuff they put up with all the time, but they did move shortly after that. 